You know, it's times like these, Alex, that I'm reminded that this is a time of Thanksgiving. And it's a time of Thanksgiving, not just because we get, you know, turkey and football and all that stuff, but also thankful that we had a good DC movie. That we did. We did indeed. Um, and we're going to go into detail here. First of all, happy Thanksgiving for those who celebrate it. Welcome to another Dracon Shadow Vlogs where we talk about the latest movie that has just barely come out and we give our thoughts on it. Um, and this one has been long in the making because we knew it was coming. Uh, ever since we did... Well, our first vlog on this was actually a, a live podcast of Geek News where we talked about Batman v Superman or the case of Batman v <laughs> Superman in regards to Dawn of Justice or to the Dawn of Justice. But now we're actually getting into Justice League itself. Now, people might remember we weren't that optimistic walking out of Batman v Superman we or BBS. We were. Oh, I can't even remember, like, the thoughts we were having, but we were all very scattered on it. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of things led up to that. It was the buildup was horrible. And and when we actually got to the legit fight, it just wasn't enough. And Wonder Woman was really the only thing that came out that was good in the whole thing. But. Well, except for you, you, you actually found a couple of things like the Jesse Eisenberg Lex Luthor to be enjoyable. Yeah. And I like Ben Affleck as Batman. Mm hmm. But um, we were all very pessimistic yeah. about about the DC universe. And well, Wonder Woman came out and that kind of changed. Well, first of all, the trailers started coming out for Wonder Woman and Justice League. And we were like, oh, my gosh. A DC movie with more colors than brown and gray. Oh, it's amazing. I don't know what to think right now, Alex, you know. And finally, we got to see Wonder Woman and you and I both liked it. Um, we saw the problems that a lot of people had with it, but we liked it. Uh, and now we are here to Justice League. So once again, if you are joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, we used to do spoilers on this thing. We are not doing it anymore. No, we still do spoilers. We just don't do the. Yeah, we, we, we don't go. the. We don't give you step by step the plot. If you want that, wait for the in upcoming. And I know it's upcoming. Nostalgia Critic and Angry Joe video because that's coming. It has to be. Yeah, because it's Justice League. Um, so, yeah, we'll we'll go spoilers, but we're not going to be going like point for point on the matter and frankly with justice league there's a lot to cover so it's it wouldn't even work for us to be able to do that and i guess the first thing that i want to actually start up with was uh before we get into the goods the bads um the one thing i don't think is getting a lot of of coverage or at least a lot of debate on the matter is the characters themselves and how they're written and how uh there might actually be departures from when how they were previously written so if you don't mind, I'd actually like to go down that road, kind of like what we did with Age of Ultron way back when, mm -hmm. and actually go into like how these heroes and and villains were covered. Um, and I'm, I want to actually add in the three, because it's kind of clear that, that we're, there were different writers responsible now. And so we aren't necessarily walking into the exact same characters that they were in Man of Steel and the case of Batman v Superman in regards to the Dawn of Justice. <laughs> I have no problem saying that ever because it's hilarious. Uh, so I, I guess, like, let's just go down the line and say, like, our opinions on the characters themselves and their development throughout the movie. Because okay. it's fairly safe to say some people got spotlight, some people didn't. Mm -hmm. And let's start off with the the... Should we start with Batfleck or should we start with uh, with with Super Cavill? Let's start with Superman. Super okay. Cavill, just because Man of Steel was the first. Or the man movie. with the CG lip. The man with the CG lip. Yeah, fun fact, if you didn't actually know that, I guess he was... I, I remember seeing stories on this, that's why I know. He was on set with a mustache. Yeah. And was never told to shave it. I think... Well, I think it was only in reshoots that he had the mustache because by yeah, then, so they had to CG him out, and so like in that yeah. first little bit, you can tell it's CG'd, and there are some fight scene ones where you can see it's a CG upper lip. Yeah, because by by the time reshoots happened, he was already on another project, and that required him to have the mustache. So that's probably why he wouldn't shave at all. Yeah. So at that point, um, yeah, let's start off <laughs> with Henry Cavill. Um. 
compared to so like I said, it looks like a different writer was in there. So how how were you before Justice League with Henry Cavill? Man of Steel, Batman v Superman. How how did you feel he was written as Superman? I can tell they were definitely going for the for a very different Superman with this one from Man of Steel. Man of Steel, it's a and I can see why, because it's a departure from Christopher Reeve and from the Brian Singer Superman that came before it, because the Brian Singer man really tried to follow the the Richard Donner Superman. And so obviously Zack Snyder and Christopher Nolan to an extent wanted to kind of reinterpret the character this time mm. and try something a little new. So as far as I can recall with Man of Steel, he was a bit more of a person who had to really kind of come to terms with what it means to be a godlike figure, or at least come to terms with what kind of power let's, he let's, has. Let's not beat around the bush. He was a godlike figure, according well, to Zack Snyder and Christopher Nolan. Well, that's Superman for you. He's always a godlike character. Mm, no, I'm, I'm not going there. Come on, he's always he's got, been written as he's, he's been written as not the, that. Yeah, come on. Even even his origin is very biblical. Mm, I'm not there again. There, there are points in Superman's history where he has been written as. Uh, it, yes, I, I'll agree with you. There are points where he's been written as a Jesus like character and those annoy the crap out of me. But when he's written proper like he was back in the good old days, he's just a uh, boy. He, he's a very hokey Boy Scout character. And I would dare say, like, they haven't had the whole ponderings of, am I a god? No, you're not, because you can be killed. Every time people bring that up, are you a god? I'm just like, no, he can be killed. <laughs> Kryptonite anybody. Magic anybody. <laughs> they can kill him. He's not immortal. Um, Because there's asking, are you a god? Well, he's not. <laughs> then die. <laughs> um, and technically, Gozer has magic, so he would kill Superman. Um... So at that point, yeah, they, they they wrote him as like a godlike figure, which is something that's been done a lot in the current day comics, uh, especially in the new 52, where he's he's just. He's even more game shark levels of game shark than he was back in the 80s. And yeah, I'll agree with them on that. But there are points where he actually has written really, really, really okay. well. Um, but I I will stick to my guns on this where. Unlike Brandon Routh, and, and here's the funniest part. I don't like Brandon Routh as Superman. But strangely enough, I like him as the Adam in the TV series. Mm. I always find that funny. He went from being a failed Superman to being another DC hum uh, superhero and doing fairly well at that. So it wasn't necessarily Brandon Routh. It was Brian Singer. Um, so at, at, at that point, I'm, I'm not necessarily in a... I, I don't like the Brandon Routh Superman, and I don't like the... Uh, Oh, not don't like uh, Christopher Reeve. Superman is OK. He's just a little more. He's a, he's a tad more snarky than I'm used to, if that's a weird way to be able to say it. But I've never had a complaint with Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill fits the bill. He looks like Clark Kent, um, especially when he's got the glasses on. The only thing is that he's not as stutterish as like Reeves played him out to be. Uh, so I've never had a problem with his performance as it. I've always had a problem with how the character has been written, where we have to constantly go into the whole he's a god and he's God amongst men. And um, and, and that's where I've always had the problem, because I, I can guarantee you if Clark Kent actually existed, he wouldn't see it that way. Uh, but I will say that I think you and me can can agree on this. He's been written differently. Yeah. In, in Justice League. And I would actually say to a drastic improvement, because, yes, they go into the whole he's a God thing. But um, I mean, he does have a Jesus moment in this thing, so we, we can't necessarily deny that. <laughs> but the way that he took it was like the, the best way I know how to describe it is like the Superman animated series Superman or, or or the Justice League version of that, where he was he was snarky. But at the same time, he was getting stuff done. Uh, so I didn't necessarily hate the the dialogue that they wrote. In fact, one of the best moments, I think, for him was the uh, out in the fields moment where he's comforting Lois Lane because Lois is like, I broke. I'm sorry. I can't be a reporter anymore. He's like, no, 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 you can be. Come, come here. I'll hug you. You know, <laughs> I like that. That is that to me is Superman. That the guy who is willing to help people for, who are about to jump off of a building 
and give them a hug and give them what they need and save them at the same time. That is Superman. And that's why I'm saying this guy is way different than Batman v Superman, Superman, Mm -hmm. where we don't. And especially in the fact that we don't have to have that awkward moment where he was in the bathtub. (laughs) You remember that? Yeah, (laughs) it's awkward. But hey, Angry Joe made fun of it really well. Uh, So any, any other thoughts you want to add to that? No, I think I've said my piece on Superman. All right, Batfleck it is. Batfleck. Um, he will, he's actually one of the few things in BBS I didn't have a problem. Yeah. I, th- I felt he got the character. Yeah, and you could tell that this is the this is the old an older Batman. This is a obviously a weathered down Batman. It kind of reminds me of Bruce Wayne in Batman Beyond, where you know yeah. early early Batman Beyond. It's been so long since I've seen the cartoon, so I don't remember everything. But I remember at least in the first episode, at least how he's he's old. He's too old for it. Wayne Enterprises is corrupt. Gotham City's corrupt. He's just at the end, and he's cynical and he's burned out yeah. before he finds Terry McGinnis. That's what Ben Affleck's Batman kind of reminds me of. Or, or another example would probably be like, how much of Justice League did you see? Not much, really. Just episodes. Because, because at that point, I would actually say like he had a weirder issue where it wasn't necessarily the Bruce Wayne part of his life that was bothering him. It was the Batman part because mm-hmm. he was so involved with the league that he couldn't necessarily get out. He couldn't devote himself to Gotham. So I, I find the fact that you like that aspect of it, but I can see like the opposite end. Mm-hmm. And I would agree with you. I think he was a weathered version, like. And and part of that also goes into the story arc that that he goes through in the movie, where you can't actually see he regrets um, that he ever took on Superman, that he ever took, you know, that, that he ever in enga- uh, basically in his opinion he dealt the fatal blow to Superman, um, even though he wasn't the one that did it, but you know he did enough damage where Doomsday could easily have his way with with Clark, and this way this is weighing heavily obviously on the character. Um, I think also they, they did an, an interesting impact where he's slowly kind of going into that doomsday ish feel the more he unlocks about like the parademons and um, where things are going. He's he's not in a good place, basically. But yeah, I didn't I didn't have a problem with the way he was written in BVS. I just and frankly, there isn't too much change here. I would just be, I, I would say if there were slight changes, I think they were because Ben made them and maybe because I do know that Ben gets the character. He's you know, I, I've listened to a few things with him and Kevin Smith. I think he gets the character way more than he got Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he gets it enough that some of those moments like in the airplane with um, in the plane with Diana, where he was, you know, heavily wounded from resurrecting Clark We'll get there, guys. Um, And he actually has some good moments where he can be more not detached, more attached to the situation. And that's usually always been the the problem that a lot of people have with Bruce is that he gets way too detached. So I kind of like that they did that, Mm -hmm. that he actually he wasn't going to be a leader. He didn't want to be a leader, but he was at least willing to help somebody come along to be the leader. In fact, I found it interesting that he kind of wanted Clark to be that or Diana. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't care either way. Anyway. So, so your thoughts on, on justice league before I interrupted you Uh, for, for, for bad flag. Yeah. I I think being the weathered in Batman v Superman and you see this progression that he has changed since then. In Justice League here, because now he, because he's the one trying to spearhead getting the whole team together. Mm-hmm. Right? It could just be, you know, I mean, if it was Batman from, say, BVS, he'd be like, I work alone. I do what I do. But this one, you can see from, he's, he's taken the weight of what he's done with Superman and the battle he had with Superman and he's learned from it. Even if he's maybe not going off into some questionable territory later in the movie, but... But I, so I can definitely see the character progression here. He definitely has regrets. Mm-hmm. We can both agree on that. He he definitely has regrets for what happened in the events of BBS. But then he's also looking towards the bigger picture. 
Um, I also do like the fact that they kind of wrote him to be kind of like the Justice League animated series Batman, which is just because he's human doesn't mean he can't get off, you know, some sarcastic damage. Because 80% of the time, you know, you were seeing these amazing things happen with all of these other characters, and he's the guy who throws them the snarky comment. I like that. I like that concept. Especially the whole, wow, you really do dress up like a bat. That's that's cool. I dig it. <laughs> this may be a bit temporary. <laughs> um, I also did like the fact that they, they stayed consistent with the voice modulator with him. Because uh, if they'd taken that out, it would have bothered me a lot. Because I, do, I don't want to hear... Ben do the, the, the Christian, Christian Bale growl. Yeah, we, we don't want that. It yeah. makes a lot more sense for him to just uh, modulate his voice since, you know, he's rich. Yeah. And, and, and here's the thing, too. A lot of really good lines were Bruce's. You know, we, we all remember the one from the trailer. Uh, uh, you know, I can do this. What can you do? I'm rich. <laughs> What's your superpower again? I'm rich. I'm rich. Um, or the... Uh, I hear you could talk to fish. I, I actually, wow. I thought that that was going to be pulled out because that, that was like, my dick is bigger than yours. And they kept it. <laughs> I was actually surprised. But then, then they also gave him a little bit of Stark afterwards. He's like, well, I did put a tracker on the guy's coat and then he took off his coat. <laughs> so yeah, I, I actually think that there were, there was improvement to the character, but there really didn't need to be. He was probably one of the few things I did like from BVS. On to Wonder Woman. I honestly think nothing changed yeah. with her. She she really did. Like, we, we now had her history and that was it. That's really all that changed with the character. Her character didn't change. Yeah. I mean, because we already saw, you know, we've had a Wonder Woman movie very recently, obviously. So I don't think there was a whole lot more to do with her right now. I'm sure the, there's going to be more in the future as we flush out more of Wonder Woman in this new DC movie in I don't want to call it a universe because it's really not. But as we I, start I will, to flesh out DC's movie movie line a lot more and see more Wonder yeah. Woman. And we, we do know we're getting a Wonder Woman, too. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing I would like to know in regards to Wonder Woman, though, and I don't I don't know if you're in the same boat as me. We're technically dealing with two directors here, guys, because Zack Snyder left the project when it was in post-production. So. We do know that reshoots happened. We don't know necessarily how they modified or anything like that. But this is definitely one of those scenes I want an answer to. Like, who directed this uh, is the scene in the bank where she's up against the dude with the machine gun and she catches every damn bullet with the van braces. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. There was there's if that if it was Zach that did that, I owe you an apology, Zach. I think, you know, the style is very indicative of, of Zach because we see a lot of the film ramping effect, you know, where it speeds up and slows down and speeds up and slows down. Yeah, but considering how, how we've, you know, how I've been treating him, how we've been treating him when it comes to women in, in his movies, that was pretty badass. Mm -hmm. And I owe you an apology kind of thing, because that was that's like one of the main moments of the entire movie that stuck out to me Yeah, is holy crap. That should have been. Given the stereotype that we have for Zack, that should have been Superman that did that. And it was Wonder Woman. And she caught every single one of them. Well, no, she didn't catch all of them because there was one she pushed a guy out of the way. Yeah. So she wasn't going to get that. But I like that forethought. Um, so that's one of those things where I think, yeah, nothing, nothing really changed. Nothing needed to change for Diana, Diana. But you kept the pace that came from the Wonder Woman movie and that whole moment on the on the battlefront. And you brought it into a bank. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. And I'm pretty certain Snyder was producer for Wonder Woman. So I'm sure he picked up a few things from working with Patty. He, he was one of them. I know that yeah. he was one of them. And I know that Gal had. Gal was okay with it when they got to production, but when she was initially cast, she wasn't happy with it. Again, the, I've never been able to confirm it, but there has been talk that he brought in a lot of the female writers over at D DC, and they were dissatisfied with what he was doing with the characters. So at that point, I mean, if he if he fixed it, great. Um, but I, I think, in all honesty, I, I almost wonder also if he brought in Patty to help out help write that. Uh, just to be able to have that extra moment to or it might have been because that took her to another level. Yeah, that took her to Superman level right there. Could have also been uh, Whedon's writing there. It could have been. Th that's why in a lot of cases I want to know who actually did that. Was it a reshoot or was is that the way it was supposed to be intended? Because if it was Zach, I'm sorry. That was awesome. 
that was amazing. You, I, I wish you would have brought this in sooner. Um, there isn't much to add to Diana, though, unfortunately, because, again, she she kind of stays the same. She is. I, I mean, the only difference that I would say is like she's as jaded as she is in BBS, but she's starting to open up and become the the Wonder Woman she was in the movie. Uh, so now we get to get to the new guys. So, um, unfortunately, I don't remember this guy's name, but uh, the guy who played Victor Stone. Let's get into him. He had kind of a, a more pivotal role in this series, in this movie, and he was necessary for this movie. Um, how do we how do we feel about how his performance went out as Victor Stone, a.k.a. Cyborg? Yeah, I liked him. I thought he was really good because I don't know much about Cyborg. I think Cyborg's one of the Teen Titans, too, isn't he? Isn't he there? started as a Teen Titan. Yes. Right. So, yeah, that's more of the it's just in, in current canon. They've actually bypassed that history and, and just made him a member right. of the Justice so, League. Yeah, so that's more of my knowledge of Cyborg is him and the Teen Titans. So to see him now in the Justice League is a real, you know, it's a nice change. It's interesting to me. Did you did you like that he said booyah? Yeah, I liked it. I knew that was a call out to, to, to Teen Titans fans. They had to do that. Um, no, I actually agree with you. So <clears throat> were Teen Titans kind of... I have to point this out because the, the original Victor Stone is what we saw on camera. Mm -hmm. Dark, somber, doesn't like what he's been, what doesn't like what he's become, et cetera, et cetera. But when Teen Titans brought him in, you know, it was a more comedic series. So they had to make him more comedic and they, they, they did a good job as far as I'm concerned. And they even had some really serious dark moments for, for Cyborg in that series. But this had to be the darker Victor Stone because of the origins and I actually think that they delivered that really, really well. I especially love the whole concept of like every day his body upgrades. And he was like, I couldn't do that yesterday. Mm -hmm. And he and he's getting more and more and more afraid of himself. That was a nice touch because that's how Victor is in the comics. Like every time he or, or, or it's not necessarily the truth, because like they they did the origin for him differently, where he was remade into some parademon technology. And that's why he constantly adapts. But I believe in the, the way that it worked in the original comics is he would get hurt. And then his dad, who he didn't trust, who we got to see on camera, he didn't trust him, would modify him even more. And so at, the, at that point, he, he never wanted to see his dad. But every time he got hurt, they had to bring him back in to fix him. So at that, if I'm wrong, people will let me know. Uh, but I did like the fact that. Uh, because of the mother box instead of the parademon technology in it, it's still connected to apocalypse that you still had those constant modifications, those constant updates. I like the fact that occasionally he would give us a, a hint of doubt where he would start speaking in what I'm guessing is apocalypse language. Y you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Where all of a sudden he's trying to scan for the mother boxes. And he starts talking like, it. sorry. And does that. I like the fact that that gave us kind of a hint of, could we trust him? Uh, could eventually he create problems? And in fact, they gave us reasons not to trust him because uh, of the whole defense incident with Superman. He mm -hmm. he was the guy that fired the first shot. We all thought it was going to be, um, I don't know, Aquaman or Batman. But no, it was Cyborg. The one guy we didn't think was going to do it and thought this was a good idea. His defense system activated and he he was the one that fired the first shot. That was pretty freaking out or a freak out moment. Um, and I just, I, I also liked a lot of the emotional moments with him too, where he was trying to, trying to determine, am I even human anymore? Yeah. Um, and I thought it was actually a really good idea to partner him with Wonder Woman, who's also trying to examine her own humanity. She just found out that she's, well, a God. So at that point, you know, is there any human in her? And I like that they kind of shared that journey together. Um, which is also why I like the next guy we're getting into, Ezra Miller, a.k.a. the uh, Barry Allen, The Flash. And I also love the pairing with him and Bruce. It really worked. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on Ezra Miller? I liked him. He's a good Flash. I, Flash is not a character I have a lot of knowledge of. I haven't seen a whole lot of him beyond the occasional card. Here's all you cartoon. need to know. He, yeah. He's the guy that breaks more rules in comic books than even Superman. <laughs> No, this is true. He he actually breaks he breaks the laws of physics, I think, on a daily basis. So, I mean, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. So Flash is interesting. I I didn't know 
I didn't know his backstory, right? I guess that's his dad in prison. It's the new uh, backstory. Like, the original backstory, he was just a guy. Mm-hmm. Um, like, because I've seen the origin of, of uh, Barry Allen, but they've recently added in, and, and even the TV series added the whole incident where his mother was killed and the, the only person that was blamed was his dad. And so you have that to go with. The difference in this, um, the way that the comics and the TV series go is that he immediately goes into the police department to be um, a forensics expert. Whereas here, he never did anything until the end and became a forensics expert. So there is a there are slight differences in this Barry. Right. So, yeah, that's it. Pretty much. That's really all you got. Okay. Mm-hmm. so, yeah, I, I like the Ezra Miller performance. In fact, it's one of the best parts of the whole movie for me, because any time that the, the movie gets too dark, they have Barry say something that brings you right back into. Oh, yeah, we're watching a superhero movie. Um, I, I, especially when we get into my favorite scenes, one of my favorite scenes does involve Barry and his evolution. Cause the other part that I like is that he isn't a hero. When, when we meet him, he's doing this for frivolous gain. You know, he's, he's using his powers for his own purposes. He's not even getting a job. He's not doing anything like that. In fact, uh, when, when you get to his flash lair, I'm pretty sure 80% of that might've been stolen. Um, or, or at least like he got it out of uh, of dumpsters when nobody was looking and nobody could have noticed him taking it. Uh, but he's not a hero right off. It takes, uh, what, 20 minutes in the movie and then he saves his first person and then he's the Flash. Yeah. Then he's the guy that we know. So where does Suicide Squad fit in? Because you do see him in Suicide Squad. I know, right? That that was the weirdest part, too. It's like, where does that fit into the timeline now? Because, yeah, you Because he did capture, what was it, Captain Boomerang? Yeah, yeah he captured Captain Boomerang, uh, which is one of his villains. So at that point, it's like, okay, so Suicide Squad obviously happened way after this. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Yeah, I guess it happens after Justice League. I guess so. Um... Can we get some clarification on that? That'd be (laughs) awesome. And finally, the one that everybody was kind of worried about because this hero has some problems is Jason Momoa as the Arthur Curry, a.k.a. the Aquaman. The Aquaman. Um, A lot of people were like me, were worried about bringing Aquaman to the big screen. And a lot of that is simply because of the stereotype (laughs) that he's just the dude that talks to fish. (laughs) And I and before Aldo Gomez reaches out to us and wants to smack us both upside the head, I know he's more than that. I know that you can do a lot with Arthur Curry if you if you play your cards right. But I was worried that because the Hollywood stereotype is dude who talks to fish, they wouldn't. They would instead make him kind of a wussy hero and therefore leave Jason Momoa up a creek. But the way they did it far from what we got he was the warrior that i've known arthur like like i haven't read a lot of aquaman i've read his recent runs where you know he has a trident for a hand uh and so he's badass in those and i think that's really where they were aiming is is recreating that arthur curry instead of uh the the one that's the super friends era kind of guy what what did you think about jason momoa's arthur curry he's another one i liked i'm now really interested in the aquaman movie that's coming because I really do want to see more of Aquaman. I want to see more of what's what's his story. And I think his movie's next. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, well, I think so. I think we'll we'll double will. check it. But yeah, I'd I'll, I'll be excited for that too. Um, I, I love also the fact that Jason Momoa... I'm not saying that all of his roles are bad, but, but for some reason, the roles that he does have, or that, that are awesome for him, are always where he's very soft-spoken. He doesn't talk much. Um, they just kind of put him in there and, and make him all imposing. And this was kind of that role, too. Aside from one scene, which was one of my favorites, where he does do a lot of the talking. But, I mean, most of his stuff was, hmm, dude who dresses like a bat. I can dig it. <laughs> kind of thing. And that made me instantly go back to where I've seen Jason Momoa the most, Stargate Atlantis, where he's just usually the guy of, hmm, should we shoot him? <laughs> you know, that's usually his, his viewpoint on the matter. Uh, and I liked him. I liked what they did with him. I was especially worried about the underwater combat. They they made that look really good for him. Um, so that makes me somewhat excited for what they could do for him um, in the Aquaman movie. Because uh, I have a feeling they'll they'll go full bore on him. 
uh, to, to flesh him out. So overall, we're saying like all of these are fairly good. Yeah. Performances from all of them, uh, especially considering what they had to work with. And this is more of a in a lot of cases, more of an origin story for them than anything else. This is like this is basically Zack Snyder saying, I don't want to do separate origins. I want their first movie to be something they're dealing with kind of thing. Basically go, I want to Iron Man to this and you're all at Iron Man 2 level, not necessarily at origin. And you already have this awesome moment that establishes you. <clears throat> so now that we've done all of that, let's get into what we liked, what we didn't like. What did you like about Justice League? OK, well, we've gone through the whole cast roster, so it is a good cast. Yes. Good well, we haven't gone through the villains, but we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, so I really like I'm trying to think there is a lot to like about this movie. Uh, well, I like the fact that Danny Elfman. It, it was not brown and gray. That's yes. what, that's one thing to like. There is a lot more color in this, thankfully, than than Batman v Superman. Yes. Or, most of other Zack Snyder's films. Heaven forbid there are purples and greens and <laughs> blues. And reds. So yeah, Superman's got the classic red out. Did, red did you see the, did you notice that they, they changed the, the Wonder Woman and the Superman costume to be lighter in blue? Yeah. I awesome. love that. That was so sorry, I, I keep interrupting. Yeah, but. so Yeah, I like and you probably you probably caught this too, I don't know, but uh Danny Elfman really snuck in a few of his own cues from his mm -hmm. original Batman 89 score. Oh yeah. And always when Batman was on screen. Yeah. And, uh, even the, even the John Williams Superman theme got a couple notes played yep. for him. That was one of the things that was awesome. Like, um, where Joss Whedon with the original Avengers just said, I want to have these cool team up moments. Um, in particular, the one that sticks out to a lot of people was Iron Man using Captain America's shield to destroy everything. And then Thor and Hulk punching everybody. Uh, this was is was instead um, Danny Elfman putting in slight homages to them as individuals when they were on screen. Yeah, and I, I like that a little bit because with um, with Ben, you would get the da 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 uh, slightly put into when he was having a badass moment. Then you would get the dun 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 dun. You know the build up to Superman. You never got the full Superman theme, by the yeah. way. Yeah, and you didn't get the full Batman theme either. And just... then with with Wonder Woman, you got the dun 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 dun. dun <laughs> yeah, like they that was the only one you got full. Yeah, and I expected that at least. Because yeah, that's from the more recent. But the cool Superman. part was is like Victor kind of had a colder, more melodic tone when he was up on screen and i don't know how they pulled this off but i almost felt like i heard the flashes tv theme the current one whenever he was on screen it was like and i was like wow holy crap that's amazing and aquaman got something i could actually he's actually the one i couldn't tell yeah We'll have to see what they do. He was just Jason badass movie. on screen. That, yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. Jason Momoa has the presence there. So, yeah. But yeah, the, the music was where they kind of brought them all together. Because I don't even think there's a, a Justice League theme, is there? I have no There's idea. not a da, 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 like there is for the Avengers. No. So. We'll have to take a look at the soundtrack. But. Yeah. And, yeah. And what else did I like? I like the, there's a fair amount I liked. I mean, just. You know, I think this movie was benefited by being a little shorter, being a little more focused than Batman v yes. Superman. There's not a lot of dead end cues. There's not a lot of like, oh, look, we're hinting at something that's yet to come. You know, there's no random ben, ba uh, Batman having a random dream where aliens and evil Superman are attacking the planet, even though this is kind of the payoff to the dream in Batman v Superman. So it makes sense now. But I'm glad, again, the movie has feels a bit more focused it doesn't feel like it's going off on a million tangents we are getting the mini origins of all these characters mm -hmm. in in concise ways in uh quick enough ways that you feel like you're getting enough story you're getting enough exposition but you're not being hit over the head with it no and you're not feeling like you're missing a whole bunch of cliff notes here so that's what i liked and i think that's where the movie excels there a lot is yep getting all the characters introduced in a timely fashion without without being too terribly long and being and able to also do it clearly and concisely also establishing their characters along with cuz mm -hmm. i mean just as much time was devoted to Amy Adams 
as Lois Lane uh, as I think was devoted to any of the other side characters they did. So like Alfred, Jamie, Jeremy Irons, Alfred got a lot of screen time. Uh, Barry's dad, for as much as you can actually do with him, got a lot of screen time. Uh, and even Silas Stone. I, I was actually kind of surprised we didn't go down the route of Silas Stone is evil. And they kind of didn't go down that route. He was just, you know, another dad um, for for Victor just to, to be because we know we're getting a, a cyborg movie. So I think it's also a good thing to set up these other characters for these other movies. And I felt like they got an adequate amount of spotlight for them. Um, probably Alfred got the most because he was there the most. But. Yeah, because he's Alfred. It's Jeremy Irons, yeah. man. We're you know, not going to say no to that. You know, Jeremy Irons' Alfred really reminds me of the animated series Alfred. The, yeah, a little bit, yeah. You know, more than any of the other... Al- all the uh, all the Alfreds through the years uh, in the movies have all all done their own things, and that's great. Mm-hmm. But I, I really do think Irons kind of emulates almost the animated series Alfred. He's definitely a different take than the Dark Knight trilogy's Michael Caine yeah. Alfred. Um, and I actually, I, I'm kind of there with you. I'm, I'm almost liking this Jeremy Irons one more than, I'm not saying the Michael Caine Alfred doesn't have good moments, but this one just seems to have a little bit more supportive role and also a little bit more snark yeah. than the Michael Caine one could have. How would so, you describe Michael Caine's Alfred? Uh, dark and somber, like like the, the trilogy itself. Yeah. Because like that, that was where they went into kind of the dark history of Alfred and and where he's trying to teach Batman that you're he's trying to teach Bruce that, you know, you're you're saving the world and you, you think this is a good thing. The problem is, is that the beings like the Joker are going to come out of the woodwork and mm-hmm. you've created this problem, too. Whereas Jeremy Irons is, is more approaching this along the line of, yes, that's what happens. But somebody needs to be there for when the big moments happen yeah. to, to show it to ground you. Um. And in turn, I again, I also love a lot of the snarky moments that he got to have. I can't remember what it was, but it was like, oh, look, someone's going out on a date. At least someone is, <laughs> you know, that was actually a really good moment for for Jeremy to, to toss in. Um, So, yeah, I, I just wanted to make that point. Like even the side cast got a really good uh, spotlight and holy crap, Easter eggs galore mm-hmm. in this one because uh, if people watch the well the Lord of the Rings battle of with all the tribes of man against apocalypse you got to see some some nice little Easter eggs of Green Lanterns being in there so that that gives me hope I want a Green Lantern movie um, and I might just get one uh, I also like the fact that they brought in the gods because the old gods were a thing and so were the new gods um, which is you know Apoc or a dark side is a new God. And so is Orion and a few others. So I like the fact that they, they brought in lines of like, Oh, your gods, they died. Cause that's, that's DC canon. Yeah. They died. Um, so I like those moments. Uh, I think, I think we've ogled it. Well, and also like best moment in the movie for you, like best moment, or if you want to toss in the second one, you can. Yeah. I do. The, the moment that basically just like anchored you. And yeah. you were invested. It definitely was the bank robbery scene where Wonder Woman comes in and kind of pulls a Superman, but I liked it. Yeah. Because, well, she's got to be the, for the time being now, because Superman's dead, essentially, but she's got to be the Superman and she's trying to be that uh, be that figure for everybody and yeah. trying to do that. So I liked that. I liked seeing Wonder Woman go in and save the day like that. Um. I kind of have multiple moments for for individual characters, but I'll, I'll try and keep it as concise as I can. You brought up the Wonder Woman one. That was an awesome moment for me that that established that Wonder Woman was not going to be filler in this. And I really like that. Um, the my by far favorite part of this, and it's the part that immediately invested me in this movie, especially since I had to sit through 20 minutes of he's gone. <laughs> And I was not happy about that. I was like, oh, crap, we're going already with a BVS tone Um, was when they were going to save the hostages from Star Labs and Flash admits to Batman. He's like, I don't save people. I've never saved people. And I thought the way that Ben handled this was the perfect way. Save one. Once you say because because at that point, once you save one, you're going to save others. Kind of thing. And I, I like the fact that he he's like, what do I do? What do I do, Bruce? I, I don't know what I do. Save one of them. 
Save one. Save one. And then he does. And then he does, and he's okay with it now, and now he's saving everybody. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. So like, like that was an awesome funny. moment to to establish that Batman does care. He just doesn't show it that well. And also to establish that we were we were seeing the makings of a hero in Barry Allen. So I like that one. Uh, my favorite super Superman moment was kind of a tie between the uh, the snarky moment between him and Cyborg, which is like, yeah, because I, I kind of like being alive. And then, boom, I take that back. I want to be dead. <laughs> um, and then also the the, the moment on uh, or in the farmer's field where he was he was holding Lois as well as his mom. Um, that to me anchored that this writer whether it was Zach or not, finally gets the character oh, we had, and is finally displaying it properly. Yeah. Well, we had two people, Chris Serino and Josh Sweden, who wrote the screenplay and Zack Snyder penned the story. Penned the story, but I have a feeling like enough of these moder- modifications were done by that. Yeah. So but that's usually how it is, is the story is kind of the first, kind of your first draft yeah. and then your actual, that if you ever see a just as a fun fact for anybody who wonders the difference here, if you see a story credit, it usually means it's an early, early draft. Yeah. And then when you see the screenplay credit, that means it's generally more of the... Re- that's and I think like storyboard is coming. like a second a second draft, isn't it? Yeah. When they start actually trying to visualize it. Yeah, storyboard's when you start to put it to visualization and yeah. put it to screen. So there you go. Um, Another great moment I, I'm going to toss out there was uh, one of the Easter eggs... Actually, I, you know, you know what? I, this one needs to be all piled together. But the the first Easter egg, and we'll get to the Easter eggs. Don't worry about it. Um, where Flash and Superman decide to race? That was awesome. That was one of those things that was really awesome. But the thing that made that awesome wasn't the Easter egg itself. What made that awesome was them fighting off Superman and Barry in the Speed Force, and Clark is tracking him. <laughs> like that slow turn, I can see you. And then eventually he starts, you know, trying to fight off uh, Barry. So you had that moment. And then you had the moment later where they're trying to save people and just going, or th- they kind of tease the whole, I can run faster than you or I can go faster than you. How about you go left and I go right. And you have fl- uh, Flash save the one truck and <laughs> Superman save the building. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. So all of that leading up into the Easter egg of the race was great. Uh, a great thing to do. Um, Cyborg didn't have too many major moments uh where where he got to be like super super positive but pretty much when uh he was when he was dealing with diana was where you got to see a little bit of humanity kind of shine through with him oh hi (laughs) Hi. we'll be right back aria no oh aria hey mommy yes you haven't seen the movie girlfriend i know you want to be in here but we got to record which mommy Oh, come on. Go with mommy. You want to go with mommy. So much. So much. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) There's something fun in here. Always happens. <laughs> so you'll need to cut that out, obviously. Obviously. Fire. Okay, so after we were invaded by <laughs> Drac Jr., uh, I think we've gone plenty into the, the positive. What didn't we like about the movie? I didn't really like the whole alien invasion plot, mostly because that's so very Marvel. And, you know, we all love our Marvel movies. Well, they both do it. <laughs> I know they both do yeah. it, but I'm just saying that's very Marvel at this point. So I yeah. feel like, you know, DC, you know, you want, obviously, you know, we get it. Business-wise, DC, Warner Brothers are wanting to play catch-up with Marvel. But mm. at this point, it's like, okay, play your cards right. You can play catch-up, but still be your own thing and be different. So I would have almost said, put off an alien invasion to, like, Justice League 2. I, I'm really surprised we're... I thought 
this was going to be a full two-parter, kind of like long two-parter, but mm. I guess not. But but uh, I think like put off the aliens to like the to like um. To, although, like, a... although in in your argument, I do think that Justice League Two will take the next step of the invasion. Yeah, kind probably. Of thing. Un- so, unlike what uh, Avengers Two did, which was to go a more uh, a more terrestrial threat. Mm-hmm. So I just you know I, <coughs> I feel like the alien the whole alien plot is it's too much Avengers too soon here, you know for DC because I want DC to be successful, but I also want them to do their own thing. I don't want them to play copycat to Marvel, you know. Let Marvel do, be Marvel and let DC be DC, and. So I would have personally not done the whole alien plot. I maybe would have taken more cues from the uh, from the concepts of Superman, re- not Superman Returns, Superman Lives, mm-hmm. right? The concept of resurrecting Superman, and you know maybe maybe the resurrection it goes wrong at first, and and Superman becomes Bizarro Superman or something cons- something like that, and eventually, of course, you get Superman back. You get at the end of the film. I would say to the movie's credit, though, that if you took out the sci-fi elements to it, like, you know, the the parademons are very much a sci-fi element. They look robotic and all that. If you look at just Steppenwolf and what Apocalypse was trying to do, like the whole conversion of the planet into like a hellscape, you could justify a little bit that it it did feel kind of fantasy a little bit. I don't mind that there's fantasy or sci-fi because that's superheroes. They all you just didn't like the fact that it was aliens. Yeah, because I. Because it's just too Marvel for right now. I know it's going to happen sooner or later. All superhero comics, movies, whatever, have aliens at some point. Yeah, and and a lot of the bigger threats that exist in both universes are from space. And I get it. You know, you're putting together a league of superheroes. You need a really big, big threat. Mm -hmm. But But it's not to say that they couldn't have brought in other more terrestrial threats. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could have had Lex Luthor... I mean, for crying out loud, Suicide Squad brought in an ancient Mayan god. Yeah. yeah. So it's like we've we've already had the supernatural ele- elements already. And again, Marvel's doing that so much anyway. So play play a little different for a while, DC, before you go to there. Yeah. You know, I think you could have done something. Oh, Lex Luthor gets out of prison and unleashes, you know, Doomsday 2.0. Maybe not Doomsday per se, but something to that, to the gravity of Doomsday, right? The problem, I think, with that, though, is that the end of BVS kind of makes it very clear that He's going crazy, and part of that is because he sees what's coming. Mm-hmm. Like, he he was the hint in BVS that Darkseid was coming. So at that point, that almost makes me wonder, okay, if he knew, then he would help in that. So you would have still gotten the same plot line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Still, I think, if not Lex, and I'm spitballing ideas off the top of my head, but if not Lex Luthor, then again, just sort of do the concept of Superman lives, the whole concept of trying to resurrect Superman. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but it goes horribly awry. That's just quickly what I thought. So, yeah, that'd be my negative is I didn't care for the whole aliens plot here. Um, I have a love hate relationship with this movie, because as much as I could say that there are awesome moments, there were moments that made and Alex can attest to this. There were moments that made me absolutely groan. Um, I will admit that the apocalypse thing did make me groan, but that was just simply because I thought we were after three movies going to see what is probably considered one of the the biggest threats of the DC universe on screen. And like I said, with BVS, you hadn't earned doomsday. You certainly hadn't earned dark side. And so at that point, I want more of a buildup to dark side, but I will give it credit because dark side never showed up. They stuck with uh, Steppenwolf, one of the the minions of Apocalypse, as the main villain here. So we didn't even get to see the real... F- Th- that's the, the cool part here is that, yes, it was an alien invasion, but you didn't see, like, the legit threats. The, the big generals were not in here. Uh, so at that point, that actually opens up things for... I actually said this wrong last night where I said it was Gorgeous George. It's Glorious Godfrey, Desaad, Granny Goodness, you you would... Uh, Calabac, you'd get all the, the good generals of uh, of Darkseid. So I like the fact that they did. They at least didn't put Darkseid on camera. Um, They they took the Marvel route. They decided Thanos should, should not... Or their equivalent of Thanos should not be on screen just yet. 
Uh, the one thing that drove me nuts, though, and you and I debated this last. So fun fact, we actually saw this last night and we're, we're doing it this morning. Um, I was not cool with how they were bringing back Superman. And here's the thing. I already wrote I already wrote away in my head that you could have made this work and I would have been OK with it. And my main problem was, is that. Bruce knows the actions of death. And I just don't given his his writing arc, I can see why they went that route. But I given what I love about Bruce Wayne as a character, what I love about Clark Kent, what I love about Diana Prince, they would not condone resurrecting the dead. They would they would never do it. That's a Frankenstein esque thing. They'd all see a problem to it. Diana would have stepped in and said there's going to be ramifications if you do this. She didn't actually step in. Well, she she kind of did, but not for those reasons. Um, she was more along the lines of, wow, he's going to be pissed when you resurrect him. Um, Clark wouldn't have condoned it if he was alive and Bruce certainly wouldn't have been arguing it. Um, so that was my, my main issue with the matter, but here's my fix to it. All right. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out here and see if you guys like it. Bruce is all for this. And all of a sudden, right when they're about to drop the, the mother box into the tub to resurrect him. Bruce stops them and says, no, we can't do this. This is wrong. But then all of a sudden, boom, parademon invasion. And then because of the circumstances and having to deal with all of the crap, somebody knocks the mother box out of, I think it was Victor that was holding it mm -hmm. out of Victor's hands and you get the resurrection anyway. Okay. Because then it, by circumstance, this is what happens. Cause then at that point, I think you, you, bring the characters back up to that high point where they're not going to put their friend through pain or who they perceive to be their friend through pain, but through necessity, he, he comes back anyway, but then you still do everything else that happens. Like he goes off to the farm and he realizes that he's still pissed off at Bruce and all that. And then he comes in at the end. I still would have done that, but that's my only well, one of two. The second one was, Holy crap. This thing started off like BVS. Oh my gosh, there was 20 minutes of we can't live on without Clark. We can't go on without. S you even had a criminal from Gotham say it's because he's dead, isn't it? Like you mother. F you don't care. You don't care. He you care about the fact that you can get your scores now and you don't have God hunting you down. Uh, that's where you care. And so there, there was just a solid 20 minutes of Life can never be the same. Lois Lane can never write again. And then I actually thought this was a really bad enabler is that as soon as he's back, she's writing a story again. I was like, you, he said it to you on the farmer's field. You could have written a story. You could have written a story. It doesn't matter that I was gone. You could have done it. I had faith in you. Um, so those are my two main moments, but when you look at the the grand scheme of the movie, they are pebbles in a pond mm -hmm. compared. Because when those things happen, yeah, they pissed me right the hell off. But then other things fixed it and it made it better for me. So at that point, I think it, it has some bad moments, but they ultimately get fixed. Oh, and another good moment that I forgot to add in there because we, we said we were going to bring it up. Uh, the moment where Aquaman is accidentally sitting on the lasso. And he's telling the truth about everybody. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Um, I especially love that she she pulls the last out. She's like, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's like, you made me do. Uh, uh, what was that he said to Flash right after? He was like, if you repeat any of this. <laughs> kind of thing. I, I really did like that. So goods and bads. We've gone through it all. Um, I will also say this, that um, if this movie gets uh, a three hour, you know, like if we get the full cut of the movie, would you want to see it just to see what they changed? Yeah, I think I'd want to see an extended cut of this, see what's left in there, what was taken out, see how different it ends up being. Um, I will I'll admit that I want to see it. Um, I'm worried because when when Aldo sat down and watched the BBS commentary or the BBS extended, he actually was mad at it because it was just more brooding that didn't need to be there 
Uh, so I'm worried about that, but I'm really more interested in getting a commentary track because again, I want to know what Joss had a hand in and what was purely Zack. I really do want to know that because if there were moments like say the Wonder Woman one where it was solely Zack, Zack, I owe you an apology. You, you pulled it off in this case and I really wish you'd started from this angle, but you didn't. And that that's frustrating. Uh, so that being said, Final verdict on Justice League. Where do you stand with it, Alex? Well, it's definitely better than Batman v Superman. De- <laughs> loads. Loads. So I liked it a lot more. Appreciate it a lot more. So I have to leave it with a, a decent 7.5 for me. All right. So it's it's like a C plus for you yeah. right now. Um, For me, I'm going to give it a C because, again, there were those blaring moments that I had problems with but I think they fixed them enough that it, it could get the story back on track and get you re-immersed into it. But there were those moments that jarred you right the hell out, especially if you're a DC comics reader and you have certain, as- uh, certain as- or aspirations for the characters. It just, it throws you right the hell out. Um, so I'll, I'll give it a seven out of 10, honestly. So it's a solid C as far as I'm concerned. And Finally, the the one thing that I think makes us different is how much would you actually encourage people to spend to see Justice League? Uh, I usually go safe and just say, see a matinee. Well, but would you would you encourage like primetime for this? Not particularly. Not really? OK. No, um, I think you'll have fun either way. Only go prime. If you're going by yourself, maybe primetime's OK, but if you're going to go with a group do matinee. I'm going to go against you on this. Um, I think matinee is fine, but I think this is also a primetime deal. And I think this is actually a really great time to, I wouldn't say this for, for Batman v Superman um, to bring your friends that don't necessarily know the story. This is one I would, I would say this is the one you bring them to, uh, to get them invested in the characters and get them interested to maybe even look into the other movies and see what they thought of them. Uh, Because as far as I'm concerned, Batman v Superman is like the lowest point in the DC universe so far. And uh, Wonder Woman is the highest. So Justice League is like right in that middle. But I recommend uh, Prime Time. I would recommend Atmos for this, which seems like a big thing to do because of all the explosions. But I think because the music would be worth it to do an Atmos experience. 3D, I think there's enough there that that you could get something out of it. The parademons alone, I would love to see how they work in 3D glasses, just seeing all the parademons swarming around. But yeah, I'd, I'd recommend going full bore on this one. I think it's worth it to to at least give that a chance. Even, even when I say this, because unfortunately we thought that Justice League had a good opening weekend. It actually didn't. Um, it's It actually was 14 million short of its expected mm-hmm. one. Uh, cause it hit 96 million, uh, with just the U S release. It got a little bit more out of worldwide, but again, it was 14 million short of projections. So I'm kind of hoping guys that, that we don't have the BVS syndrome here and we have a 60 per 60% shoot down. Uh, especially if this is, this is a good movie. As far as I'm concerned, let's support this one. Yeah. Let's show Warner brothers that they got it right this time. And that we want to see more of this stuff because this made me excited for even more DC movies. And I think that's going to go ahead and do it for us. I think we've talked you guys ears off long enough. Uh, thank you guys for watching. If you guys haven't seen justice league yet, go and see it, go and show your support. Uh, this is one of those moments where I would say, yes, let's support the DC universe because wonder woman got it right. And justice league so far has gotten it right. Let's keep that support going. And I guess the next time we will see you guys will be well, when we step back into a galaxy far, far away and we step into star Wars episode, episode eight, eight, the last Jedi. Or is it? Yes. The last Jedi. Wow. Okay. No, no last Jedi. We'll see you guys. All the Jedi's are gone. We'll, we'll get a prozac budget going too. <laughs> Damn you. K2SO.